This episode is brought to you by Rune. Click the link in the description box below for more information. So, how should you decide which DAC to buy? How will you decide which DAC is right for you? Some people, because they can't hear a DAC, they can't go out and hear it, they tend to cling too much to the chip, make and model that's used inside that DAC. And I would urge extreme caution in doing this. I'll give you an example. I use an LG V40 phone. It uses the ESS Labs 9218 DAC slash headphone chip. But so does the Shandling M0. And those two products, those two headphone outputs do not sound the same. So using the chip make and model to sort of try and predict the sound no, it's, it, I would really advise you don't do this. I know when you're looking online and when you're talking about it online, the make and model, the chip number is the thing that you can discuss. That's what makes it so appealing. The numbers make products, hi-fi products that you've never heard easy to discuss. It's the same with high-res and it's the same with yeah, DAC capabilities, what they can do. 32 bit, 34 kilohertz, my dad can do that. There's a bit of ego tied in with this as well as I think. Anyway, unlike last week, we're not going to talk about entry level DACs today. We're going to talk about high end DACs. And the specific subject of this video is the Auralic Vega G 2.1. Now, what I love about this DAC, just from reading about it online, is the manufacturer don't tell us what DAC chip is inside, which I think is fantastic because it stops people using that as a, their own mental guide to how this DAC will sound. And Aurelic are also at pains to point out that it is, it is an ESS Labs DAC chip, but apparently it's been customized heavily. So even if you did know the make and model, we don't really know what's been done to it. That's Aurelix IP. But what we should be paying just as much attention to with this Aurelix DAC are the Orfeo Class A modules that sit on the output stage. So the analog output stage that influences a DAC sound much more than the chip. And then the purer power power supplies. That's what Aurelix call them. But that's to draw our attention to the fact that power supplies to a DAC chip, to the analog output stage, really can impact the sound hugely. And so can the way that the internals have been carved up. Because I know the Auralic inside this DAC have separated out the digital section and the analog section and put a wall between them. Again, another factor that heavily influences a DAC's sound far more than the DAC chip. So we pop the lid on the 2.1. Now I'm told that this is exactly the same circuit as the version two, but on the 2.1, we have a new chassis here. Then we have a new copper sub chassis, which is very obvious. And then power transformer, mains filter, DAC board, power supply section, streaming section, volume control, output stage. And then also we've got a new base plate, which weighs a, a kilo and a half with new feet. And all of this is designed according to Aurelic to tackle the negative influence of microphony.
On the back panel, we have a choice of single-ended and balanced XLR outputs. I'm using the latter going into a PS Audio BHK signature preamplifier. And then on digital inputs, I'm just using the TOSLINK from my Xiaomi Mi Box S streamer for when I'm watching TV and Netflix on the projector behind me. Because this DAC also has an inbuilt streamer. Now, that streamer is built around Aurelix Tesla platform, but it doesn't do the server section of Lightning DS. It just does the endpoint stuff. So we get UPnP, Rune, Spotify Connect. Now, I've mainly used Rune for my listening tests for this video. But if you do want to use this as a UPnP endpoint, we do get gapless playback, we do get memory caching, and we also get BitPerfect multi-room. But for that, we could also run a Lightning server device elsewhere. So even like the Aurelic Aries Mini runs as a Lightning server, I think the Altair G1 does. I just want to quickly talk about the music or the types of music that I listen to in putting together this review assessment, if you like. The first song, and I'm focusing on songs here actually, the first is Elvis Costello's After the Fall, which is his kind of best Leonard Cohen impression that he put together with Mitchell Froome for 91's Mighty Like a Rose, which is an album that often gets slammed, but I think this song is absolutely fantastic. Next one, just like Tom Thumb's Blues from Bob Dylan's Live at the Albert Hall slash Manchester Free Trade Hall concert recording. Absolutely fantastic. This is part of the electric set that he did. Really, truly a, a thrilling listen. Going back to more sort of mellow singer-songwriter stuff, I cut over to Aztec Cameras Over My Head from Stray, the one with the green cover, which is not really typical of that album, but it's Roddy Frame's best attempt at doing some kind of Lounge jazz, uh, not lounge jazz, but just very sort of mellow singer-songwriter stuff. If you're an audiophile who likes audiophile music, you will love Aztec cameras over my head. A bit more moody, R.E.M.'s World Leader Pretend from 88. When this came out, I just thought it was the best song I'd ever heard. It's not the best recording, but it's not the worst. And then in recent weeks, Plastic Man, Richie Horton, has issued a few EPs of music that he made for Prada. And it's more ambient than Plastic Man has done for a long time. I think it's a really interesting listen. And then lastly, and this is an album actually, I've been absolutely hammering Patti Smith's Gone Again, which was, I think, the best album she'd made since Horses, even though I'm not a massive fan of Horses. Another heretical comment, I know, but Gone Again for me is Patti Smith's finest album. It's exceptionally well recorded. It's both moody and exciting and introspective and uplifting. It's often overlooked, but not by me. So what I like about statement DACs, high-end DACs like this Aurelic Vega G 2.1, compared to $1,000 DACs, say like the RME, is that they make music sound more vivid. So tonal colors just seem to be more abundant or more obvious. And these kinds of DACs also make music sound bigger not just in the, the width and the height. Actually, it's mainly the depth that we get gains with better DACs, I think. On that soundstage, we also get a better sense of illumination of what's going on. And that generally translates into what we perceive as hearing more information in the music, more detail, and probably can be loosely described as better clarity or transparency. But also in the, the sort of the meatiness, the meat on the bone that music 
present to us, or rather the DAC presents to us because it's doing the decoding. So things sound a bit chunkier, a bit meatier. So this DAC gives me all of those qualities compared to lesser DACs. This is why we spend the money if we have it. Obviously, if you're looking at a DAC like this, at 6,300 euros, I believe, you need to have the income to afford it. And there was a great quote that I read a couple of weeks ago by Jay-Z, who said, if you can't afford to buy it twice, you can't afford it. Let's come back to the concept of clarity. If you're a connoisseur of Bob Dylan, I won't say that I'm necessarily a connoisseur, I like some of his stuff, not all of it. Um, but I think if you're a connoisseur of that kind of music, you will really appreciate how you can play something like Live at the Royal Albert Hall, you can hear him belt his harmonica pretty hard, and you'll never wince, not once. And I can't say that about lesser dax, and that's not to take away from how awesome those things like the chord mojo are, because they're wonderful. But when you have better power supplies and a better output stage, you get, I think, what well, maybe better control of the music, maybe lower distortion, um, and less of a wince factor. But my favorite quality of this particular DAC, and not all DACs do this, is its jump factor, its caffeination, its, its liveliness, its microdynamic snap, crackle, and pop. It really makes the smaller details really come to life. Now, again, that might be due to, you know, that better illumination that I talked about, but from the Vega G2.1, even if I'm playing something very ambient, like that Plastic Man track, the smaller little details that he just layers in very, very subtly, they really pop out, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So if you have a, a, a sort of a lackluster sounding high-end hi-fi system, or you want more microdynamic excitement, then the Vega G 2.1 might be a DAC that would suit your system, you know, in terms of fitting together with the rest of your gear, because that is also very, very important. Because this Vega G 2.1 it really sort of comes at you, it really grabs you by the lapels and it forces you to listen. Now it's all very well to say all of these wonderful things about this DAC, but we need to ground it in reality, in context, with a comparison. So I found myself having to choose one DAC from the DACs that I have here that I could compare to the Vega 2.1. And I needed something that did Rune, that did Spotify, that had a screen on the front that displays cover art, that had single-ended and balanced outputs. And that left me with just one choice, and that is possibly one of the most popular high-end streaming DACs of recent years, the direct stream from PS Audio. And you can see it in the rack behind me here. And the direct stream happens to sell for a very similar price to the Vega G 2.1. So that sets up the comparison. Now the direct stream has always been my number one recommended DAC to people who are coming from the vinyl world. Why? Because it sounds very big, very spacious, great soundstage depth, and it has a tremendous sense of ease. Now I know that the sound has changed over the years with subsequent firmware updates. I'm using the latest one here, Wyndham. Wyndham always makes me think of Wyndham Earl from Twin Peaks. On soundstage size and detail retrieval, it's very hard to separate these two DACs. And I think the PS Audio probably has the jump on the Auralic when it comes to sort of the spatial information. I was playing this um, Barker EP, and there was this sound, this sort of, sort of scratching sound that was moving around the back. And it was much more obvious that it was right at the back of the mix 
with the direct stream than it was with the Auralic DAC. However, the Auralic DAC has a more overt sense of clarity and transparency. And it just has, it has more snap, more, more pizzazz, more, yeah, more avidity. And that once again reminds us that the Vega G2.1 gives us an abundance of blood rush, of excitement when we're listening to music. So how about one of John's special metaphors? And this one is gonna rotate around Indian food because not everybody going to an Indian restaurant likes or orders the same type of curry. So some people like the sort of creamier cormas. And if that's you, direct stream. But some people like their sort of spicy, livelier tasting Jalfrezi. And if that's you, you want the Auralic. If we have to talk about this in more mundane audiophile terms, especially one that I particularly don't like, we might say that the direct stream is the more musical of the two and that the Vega is the more accurate of the two. Even if you just say this is a matter of taste, or even if you're wrong and you say that there is no difference between the sound of any DAX, we still have to factor in volume attenuation and the need for a preamp, because normally, even with a DAC with a volume control on it, I still prefer a preamp in the chain. It makes things sound bigger, um, just more open, really. And that's why I use the PS Audio BHK signature preamp. It's fantastic. Now, I think that the direct stream needs that preamp more so than the Vega. And for the why, we have to look at how the Vega attenuates volume. Because it's not a digital volume control. It's actually a resistor ladder. When you turn it, you can hear it click. And I guess as DAC standing alone, I couldn't say which one is better between it and the Vega, but when it comes to putting it into a hi-fi system and attenuating volume, I think the Auralic has the edge here. Let's flip it around. Let's run both DACs at 100% volume and have the, the BHK Pre in the chain. For me, I think the direct stream benefits more from the preamp, the external preamp, than the Vega does. Now you might say, well, okay, John, that's fine. I can use the Vega as a, a preamp straight into a power amp, which is what I'm doing right now. It's going straight into the MyTech Brooklyn amp. What about my vinyl? You know, okay, it's a DAC, it's got a volume control. I'm still not able to put my vinyl into this system. And again, you'd be wrong if you think that, because that's not the case. Because the Vega 2.1, sorry, the Vega G 2.1 has an analog input, a single-ended analog input that goes straight to that volume control. So here I have my Technics SL1200G turntable with an Autophon 2M black cartridge mounted to it. And that's amplified at the phono level by a wired for sound phono stage. And then that is going into the back of the Vega G2.1 into its analog input. So there's an analog input that I can select on the Vega's menu system. And so I don't need a preamp for that kind of analog functionality. So the Vega can run analog sources and its own streaming and DAC sources side by side. So functionally, we do not need an external preamp. And we would need that if we wanted to run vinyl systems side by side with the direct stream. Whilst we're talking about functionality, the PS Audio 
has this monster volume control. It's like we're back in the 90s, but this does the preamp, the CD transport, and the DAC. Now, what's interesting about the Auralic, you can take any remote control and then map it to the inputs of the Auralic. Any remote control, as far as I can tell. So this morning, I mapped the little dinky Apple remote just for volume up and down, red hot chili peppers, previous track, play pause. And that's all really I need from a remote control. And I like smaller things like this because if I sit on one, I'm not a small person, I'm not gonna break it. Now the other thing you'll notice on the front of the G2.1 are two headphone sockets. And for me really, this is the most baffling feature of this product because two 6.4 millimeter sockets does not, it suggests that there's gonna be a balanced output, right? But it's not, it's just two fairly standard single-ended headphone outputs. So it's fine for sort of entry-level headphones or easy to drive headphones, but it's not as good as a, a high-end dedicated headphone amplifier. And interestingly, it's certainly not as good as the headphone output on the BHK Pre. That output is very much underrated in my book. I think it's a fantastic headphone output on that PS Audio Pre. And I guess my other niggle about this, this Vega DAC is, and this is true for all Auralic products actually at the moment, is that the way that the chassis is finished, the, the, the finish of the, the material, even just rubbing your finger along the surface, it kind of creates this white mark, which you then have to wipe off. So it's not the easiest thing to keep looking spick and span. But I, as a high-end piece of hardware, not only do I think that the Vega G2.1 competes with other similarly priced DACs as we've seen with the direct stream, but its functionality sort of takes it over the edge in that you can run a vinyl system into it and using this very, very well thought out resistor ladder volume control. So you don't need a preamp at all, which I think is pretty useful if you're putting together a high end audio system and you want small footprint gear. So this with the MyTech Brooklyn amp is, you know, it's just two pieces and it all, you know, it all works. <laughs> of course it works. But you know, I wouldn't need a full rack for it as I've got here with all my gear here today. And that's really my point today is that not only do we have to compare the, the sound quality of products, even at the high end, we obviously have to compare that, but functionality still matters when you're spending six grand. It matters hugely, it matters to me. Um, I guess maybe I'm extrapolating what matters to me as what might matter for you, but for some people out there, maybe you, you know, having that analog input is a, is a real winner or might actually tip you towards the Vega 2.1, because if I had to choose which DAC I would choose to live with for the long term, it would be the Auralic because its sound quality is as good as the rival, but its functionality, as far as I'm concerned, is a cut above. Please remember these videos are not intended as hi-fi advice. I'm just planting seeds. I'm giving you ideas of things that you might want to take an interest in. So if you like the ideas put forth in this video, please hit the like button down below. If you like my attitude to high-end audio in that it features sound quality and functionality even at the high end, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.